In this chapter, I want to talk about everything that I have the feeling I didn't cover enough in the previous videos. I mean, I've been covering a lot and probably some things were a little bit too long, some things were a little bit too short. So in this chapter, I just want to show you some things that I think might be interesting, um, just so that I have the feeling I've told you everything. Uh, for example, one thing that uh, that at least I will be experiencing in the next few months is dealing with 4K footage. So footage that is not just HD, like 1920, but that has uh, the width of 4096 pixels, or uh, eventually a little bit smaller. So just, um, just to quickly show you the challenges of that and maybe how you can overcome that. So I have this one shot and I will put the link on that on the DVD that is filmed here in Amsterdam. It's like a boat ride on one of the canals and this is 4K. I mean, the display of course is much smaller now, but um, it is in fact 4K. I had to cut off a little bit on the side because it has a weird, um, it had a weird aspect ratio. So this is now, um, this size, 3840 width and 2160 height. So that is the dimensions of these image. And as you can imagine, putting that into the RAM will be um, a little bit tricky. So I'll just open that. So here, bridges, and then open that, open clip and Alt A to playback. And that of course is not very fast. Maybe also on frame one. So this is really slow. And as you can imagine, it will not fit everything into the RAM. Now, of course, you don't have to have everything in the RAM. I mean, you can also just track while it is uh, loading from your hard drive. That is also fine. But if you really want to quickly review if the tracks are fine or not, then it's much more convenient to have it inside the RAM. So if, for example, you want to track these 250 frames, then what you can do is just track like in parts. So first, let's say you uh, can make it so that 50 frames of this 4K footage fit into the RAM, then just track these first 50 frames. So in the timeline, press E, and now you have fluid playback and you can here add the marks and track that stuff. So that is very smooth. And since this has been filmed on a boat, riding on the canal, all the tracks will be super fine and super smooth without any spikes, at least in theory, because this has been filmed with a red camera and the red has apparently quite a bit of noise going on. So if you look at that, I don't know if you can see that on this DVD. So it is in fact quite noisy. And also here, if you want to improve the tracks, then you can also try to see if you can take advantage of the color channels. So if you go in display and have it in black and white and maybe just have a look at the single color channels, then again, you can investigate which channel is best for tracking. Because here, the blue channel is again, not very great. I mean, here it is okay, but if you look at that, there is really not a lot of contrast, but compare that to the green and red channel, here is more contrast and more detail. And combining them can also help. So adding the blue channel really doesn't do any difference here, at least none that I could see. The only thing that I think might happen is that if you uh, don't use the blue channel, then you might have less noise. So um, tracking this in parts will help you to get everything into the RAM. So let's say we have tracked all this, even though the truth is I didn't because I didn't track anything. So if you have tracked these first few frames, then you can just uh, switch from end to start. So at frame 50, I will now press S, that will be my start frame. And then on frame 100, that will now be my end frame, E. And then again, squeeze everything into the RAM and then just extend these tracks from the from frame 50 to, to the next frames. And thereby, step by step, you can slowly increase the amount of uh, frames that you track and after that you will have uh, a continuous track and you can set it back to start frame one and then end frame 250. And in that case, of course, if you have tracked that and want to have that in, uh, in the 3D viewport, then you have to make use proxies. I mean, that's really what proxies are made for. 
So in this shot, um, I have no information about the lens, and at least in my tests, I also couldn't trigger the refinement. It was just the movement of these tracks has been just too smooth for the refinement to kick in. So maybe you are more lucky than me, but uh, at least I couldn't find all the real, the exact lens data. So I think it was, I think it was the red epic or the red one. Um, and then focal length of 30 or 50 or so. I have no idea. So yeah, what did I want to say? Oh yeah, proxies. So proxies, um, you have to enable the proxies. And then uh, in this case, I think it makes sense to build 25% and 50%. 100% is maybe not needed because that would also be 4K, which is very slow for playback in the viewport. Uh, but if you build at 25 and 50%, then you can switch between the really, the real low res resolution and the bigger resolution. Also, if you are using lens distortion, which in this case might not be that necessary. Then you can also build these. So build the original and build the undistorted proxies. And doing that will also take a while because uh, 4K footage conversion into, what would that be, 2K and 1K, that will also take a while. So in this case, I just want to cancel that. But uh, once you're finished, you can then in the 3D viewport set this as the background image. And and then also use the 25% proxies or the 50% proxies. And you can also switch between undistorted and not undistorted. So especially when dealing with 4K, using the proxies is a really good idea. Then next, one thing that I want to emphasize again is that you really have to have some perspective. So here I have this shot already tracked with Ton, Ton Rosendahl, the chairman of the Blender Foundation, feeding the ducks. And uh, it seems we have a lot of tracks. We have a lot of perspective. It seems we have uh, a solid track. The curves are not too jumpy. There are no sudden spikes. That looks all right. So we should, in theory, get a very good track from this. So if I now go to the camera data, set this to the Canon 550D, um, I think this also have been like 20 millimeter focal length or something like that. Um, let's have a look at the keyframes. So this is maybe one, or let's say it's here. Okay, maybe that's 77 and 113. That should be fine. 77. Seven. 113 and then solve that. So in theory, that should be a very good track, but we are at 333. Incredible, why is that? I cannot even see the camera curve. It's so far away. And that is just because even though the markers are doing all fine and the camera is moving and there seems to be a lot of perspective shift, so everything should be perfect, Let's even see with uh, refinement. So everything should be perfect. But the thing is that if you only have markers on the floor, then you won't be able to get a decent solution. So if you want to shoot something like this, where most of it is really just a flat plane, then try to make sure to at least have some corners that have some depth to it. So that are not on the same plane, but are like this, like have some height. So that's why I'm tracking this one, this one, and try to quickly do that. It doesn't even have to be that much, but just a few that really uh, help Blender to figure out the perspective. Okay, like that. Now let's see if that helps. And there we go. Now we are at 2.8, which is still terrible, but quite a bit better than 333. So again, maybe let's have a look at the curves. Eventually I have some spikes here in my new tracks. So what about this one? Oh yeah, that is sliding of course. So let me just disable that. Shift T. And yeah, this is supposed to be really 
just a very quick chapter. So a 2.8, maybe the focal length was in fact 18 or 24. Let's see what happens. So now this is totally wrong. Maybe at 24, this gets better. Now we even have refinement and there we go, 0 0.5. So just by adding something here on top of this step, gave Blender the much needed perspective information to really solve that. So just shooting something on a flat plane won't work. So try to make sure to have at least something that is above the floor. Then another very typical thing that can lead to problems is a shot like this, where you first have a lot of stuff in the foreground, but then all of a sudden um, it goes near like a railing, for example, like this, and um, all of a sudden you lose all the information about the foreground. And that will lead to a very bad jump, or at least it can lead to a very bad jump, because suddenly the tracker loses all the information about where is what in the foreground. So if I were to with the default setting. So if I were to track that here um, very quickly and um, add all the stuff here in the foreground, then of course also in the background. So if I would do that and track that, then I think it will lead to a problem. So track that and then come back. Then something that I guess I also forgot to mention, which I'm very sorry for that, is that you can also do selections based on certain properties. So if, for example, if I want to select everything that is already tracked, then I can hit Shift G and select grouped, like tracked tracks, and everything that is already tracked will be selected. So all these could be, for example, locked with Control L, so that I can then, if I now would add more stuff here, that I can then quickly select everything with A without the rest being affected. So A and then track again, like that. So Shift G is in that case very helpful. Okay, so go on. Of course, these are horrible. So I would now hit Alt T to clear that up also here and we'll quickly do that. Apparently in this case it is also super helpful to to increase the margin because all these hit the border and just avoid sliding it can help to uh, increase the margin. Okay, so at least in the first part of the shot, we should be able to get a very decent solution. So this has also been shot in Turin with the Canon 5D. So the focal length, I think it is even mentioned here in the file name. So that was 28. Keyframes, of course, have to be adjusted because uh, this is now frame 190. So eventually, maybe, yeah, like why not the first frame and then like frame 220. So this would be 197 and 220. Maybe use refinement, camera motion. And that seems to be like a very great solution. So let's have a look at the camera curve. That looks great, although that is suspicious. So here, I mean, of course, we have all this uh, information going on here in the foreground. So all that stuff, all these ones are moving very fast. So they have these very busy curves, but the stuff in the background is doing like all the same motion because there's just not a lot of difference between them. So let's see what happens in this 3D viewport. So here, 3D view, then of course also set up tracking scene. 
something's wrong. I don't know why. There's an error. Anyway, um, uh, here that is the floor. Set floor. Looks okay. We can even see this railing here. Now let's have a look at the camera path. So in motion tracking, show camera path. And you can see that this is quite good. But then if you compare that, what you just saw in the footage, then this path already shows you that something is very, very wrong. So let's look through the camera. Looks all fine. And now I think there will be a little jump somewhere. So there it starts to go crazy. And of course it does, because there is, I mean, it loses all the perspective here in the foreground. So all of a sudden this thing is gone and we are floating in space and it's totally unclear what the, what the movement is. I mean, even for me, it is really unclear what the camera exactly has been doing because all this stuff is just so far away. So in this case, uh, one very bad solution might be, or one very hackish solution, would be to track something on the water. And this is also not very safe because the water might be moving. After all, this is a river, so the water is not perfectly still. And there might be waves. It might not even be like a feature, it might be a fish. And a moving fish, of course, is also nothing that you want to track. But anyway, we have something here, so maybe that helps. Let's see, Shift S. Still a very good projection error, but the movement is still far from being optimal. So all of a sudden, when these markers are disappearing, there is a huge spike and it just goes crazy. Now, in this case, one other solution would be to stop the solution at this point and hand animate the rest. Because I mean, you can see that here, this is like one curve and eventually it would help to just extend the curve. At least it would be better than what you see here. So what I want to try is to convert this to an F curve and hand animate that. So first of all, I duplicate that just for safety. So Shift D and right click to to cancel that and then M move to layer something. Then I select the camera. Already forget about this. So I select the camera, go to the constraints and then click on constraint to F curve. And now all the positions have been animated. So this is now not the constraint anymore. This is really a keyframe for every frame. And that of course is something that you can hand animate. So if I would now open up the F-curve editor, then here are all the curves. And maybe if I split that for the dope sheet, then I could go ahead and delete all the keyframes when it starts to jump. So that would be here. This looks all fine, but then it starts to go crazy. So when I collapse the dope sheet summary, I can hit A to deselect everything here and then B for box select and select all these keyframes and for example just delete them and then the rest can be hand animated. So on the last frame we could say the camera is here. I insert keyframe for location and rotation and I mean that is of course probably not what we are really seeing in the footage but it will be better than what we had before. So if I look through the camera now, we don't see the markers anymore, but at least we can see the grid. So there's still a little jump, but I mean, that's not bad. That is much better than what we had before. So now we can really try to hand animate that to smooth out that jump. And if I grab the other camera again, where we can see the curves or uh, see the markers and maybe just to give me some hints. Um, oh yeah, why not? Just look through the camera so we can still see these markers. And now I can try to smooth out that jump by selecting my camera and then just hand animate it. 
So I guess here it should be a little bit more over there. G to grab it, move it, insert keyframe and so on. It's not perfect, but it works more or less. So this is something that you can try and everything will be better than this horrible jump. Okay, but that's it for the last tips of this DVD.